In each Masters of Beautiful Achievements Academy episode, Alexander Princeton interviews guests about how solutions inspired by nature can provide sustainable opportunities for our future challenges. Since 2013, he is globally researching sustainable business models and innovations. To share his findings, he founded the Masters of Beautiful Achievements Academy. Hello, everybody. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this new episode of the Masters of Beautiful Achievements Academy podcast. My name is Alexander Prinsen, and I'll be your host for today. Today's guest is Mr. Nicholas Wenberg, a founder of Stutfjord, and with him, we will explore the topic of urban farming in the Nordics. Um, let me first brief introduce Nicholas uh, to you before we get started. Over the last 25 years, Nicholas has been active setting new standards of growing sustainable food in cities. He, as he says, is the first urban pig farmer in Sweden since the Second World War. Nicholas introduced the first eco-labeling system for fish from the Nordic waters and also did similar projects in various countries in Southeast Asia. He collaborates in various international projects on sustainable urban development from Cape Town, Kinmushu, Manchester towards Shanghai. He is a key expert in EU funded projects like Reform to reform European standards for sustainable urban agriculture. And he's also teaching design for sustainable development at Göteborg University, Chalma University uh, for uh, the uh, architectural uh, program. And recently, um, he was granted to do a project with the Gutenberg municipality and Malmö to integrate urban farming into new built suburbs. Nicholas will tell us later more about that one. And even I understood that NASA dropped by uh, to see what Nicholas has been up to. So hello, Nicholas, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing today? Uh, th thank you. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm touched by the introduction. Uh, I, you're welcome. I respect, I respect you a lot and I listened with big ears and, and I wonder who you were talking about. But there, there is some recognition. I, I, I know the guy you were talking about. He's all right. And I'm all right. <laughs> yeah, we met each other during my stay, I think it was 2004, uh, when I passed through Gutenberg. And uh, there you introduced me to your slaughterhouse project in the middle of uh, Gutenberg. Um, and I'm just curious, how, how is that going nowadays? Well, it's, um, I would say very well. I could, uh, you know, start some name dropping. And actually, as I'm not a rich guy, I'm, I'm quite dependent on those uh, braggy points where you meet up with interesting people and interesting students because uh, we are still uh, in a startup stage. I would say that we have uh, delivered a lot to, to Nordic uh, thinking and doing when it comes to urban agriculture, but it's a startup theme when it comes to economy. So we are a bunch of people doing this, but we're not, you know, uh, we're not we haven't formed the business yet. So it's, it's both extremely promising and it's quite a quite tough life for urban farmers, for the urban agricultural team. But I should definitely not uh, complain because most of all, we are gaining access to uh, different uh, stakeholders around the table with uh, designing uh, urban resilient urban resilience and uh, functioning cities. So I would say more and more parties and interests join the talk and the design process of a better society. So we are quite happy about the, the situation. I think that uh, I was happy to have you over in the in the Slaktus. So that's the slaughterhouse in Göteborg, 100 year old uh, uh, structure that was um, well, where we killed all the animals in Göteborg, and Göteborg is half a million city, you know. Uh, and today we want to introduce another uh, setup of urban uh, food where we don't only kill people and go around in bloody clothes, but we also have bees and we have a live fish and we have an um, um, aquaponic system, which means we combine uh, plants and um, aquatic species for us, two, two species of tropic fish. 
and uh, we have a, a wish board or a wish list for different uh, kinds of urban agriculture that we want to add to to the already existing structure so the list is quite long and now we we have bees i don't yeah well, i guess we had bees when you were there we have insects and insects that eat city waste and the city waste with help of insects is converted into fish food mm -hmm. and also human food and as you can as you know and most of you guys uh, it's not just about finding a technique and the right uh, biological touch you also have to deal with legislation and uh, different standards all the time so for us to to give the insects we use tenobrium molitor which is a very common very nice kind of bug uh, that gives us maggots very uh, full and rich with good proteins mm -hmm. and uh, good fatty acids so the problem is not to find the bugs and to to make them happy over what we serve them it's to discuss who owns garbage in the city and how do you uh, decouple uh, just part of the main garbage stream and keep the uh, that garbage in the city block converting it to uh, fish food so it's about legislation so what we do and have been doing for three years it's in a you know a border zone gray or black illegal or almost illegal mm -hmm. everyone knows what we are doing but and they sort of give us a long leash they don't want to kill us but they could if they move back into uh, the law book and legislation so we have to tread quite carefully not to be too provocative we want to be provocative but also embrace and you know help people that um, are um, uh, dealing with the all, all these structures and the infrastructure for for for, for waste and other important uh, technical factors in the city. So so if I understand correctly, since since we met, you've you've experienced a lot of challenges along the way. Um, yeah. So part, yeah. Part, you're partly on the legislation part, and it's something you see quite often. Uh, I think that's all around the world that who owns what and who's responsible of what. Um, how how much does it cost? Um, then you have how do you collect it and distribute it? Logistics especially mm. in the cities is still a big challenge cost-wise. Uh, where do you bring that, wh where, where do you pick it up, where do you bring it and who stores it uh, and everything together with that. I want to, I want these kind of topics I want to put, I want to um, uh, raise later onward. Um, for now I'm really curious, um, the, the slaughterhouse, what kind of systems do you, do you have in place now? You mentioned bugs, fish, plants, what, can you be, be uh, can you explain a little bit more what, what kind of bugs yeah. and what kind of fish you're raising? What uh, put it this way that nobody asked us to set up the system. Mm -hmm. I'm working at different uh, academic institutions like Chalmers, that's a technical university. So I teach at the master's level, and the subjects like you mentioned, it's uh, sustainable cities. And my uh, topic is uh, food in a sustainable city. Yep. And I teach at uh, uh, Landbruks Universitet. That's where you, you know, you get educations around fish and uh, pigs and uh, agriculture. And uh, so nobody asked me to set up this uh, scheme in Slaktus. I I did this with my friends and with you know. Uh, my, my, my savings just to do it because all of us with some education we know it has to be done mm -hmm. it's not going to be done if nobody does it so uh, I get very annoyed uh, waiting everybody's got the policies and the strategies but it's not done so now we did and after three years we I complained a little that we're not rich and but maybe that's not the important thing but it's to make an imprint on the way people think and plan and how you um, how you recognize uh, these uh, policy these factors presented in policies but not materialized so uh, to to move quite fast to what is happening now in Sweden we just a month ago uh, you mentioned that I was working in Brussels for a with a project called Refarm Europe. And that's about finding ways to reform, reform European production of food. Mm -hmm. And uh, this uh, uh, 
system we were building or analysis we were doing, it was uh, abruptly interrupted because the guy I was working with, he's now a minister in the Swedish government. So I was, you know, oh shit, I have to move from Brussels or I enjoyed the, the Brussels thing. And, uh, but this, uh, this parliamentarian, he became a minister. So he's the minister of housing affairs in Sweden. And that's good because now uh, the government presents a plan that we have to build 600,000 new um, houses and flats for mm -hmm. people before uh, 2025. And for a small country like Sweden, you know, we're 9 million people building 600,000 new flats and houses. That's a super, it's a huge program. And one month ago, uh, the Minister of Housing Affairs, he presented the new budget for, uh, for, for how to finance this and, and what these houses should, uh, uh, should embrace. And he says that we, the government, believe that uh, building 600,000 new houses, it will include uh, production of food. And you know, that's just boom, shock waves through society. And we, the government, believe that fish and greens, that is aquaponics, will be a major, uh, will have a great influence on building 600,000 new houses. So now Sweden is the people aware of. Uh, uh, foodstuffs and urban agriculture, they wonder what the heck happened? Yeah. The minister, the government, they have gone crazy. So tomorrow the minister and his gang, they are coming to Slugtuset and we're getting some media there and they're wondering what the heck is this? Has the minister been eating, you know, toxic mushrooms from some <laughs> great, uh, Netherland far? What, what is it? So for me, um, I know what has happened because we have a good influence. We are poor, we are small. Some people think we are avant-garde, you know, out of the boundaries of what can be done. But the government today, they are pretty, I would say, they are updated and they know this can be done and it should be done. So the little place Slaktus today, it's pointed out as being uh, the place in Sweden where we do this stuff, where we actually move beyond the little um, urban agriculture box where you have a little flower and a carrot that mm. is three centimeters long. So a lot of the cities in Sweden, they, they didn't progress beyond the little flower box. They are there and they get prices and they have all the beautiful pictures from these little flower boxes where <laughs> they hug uh, old Swedes and it's integration and a lot of social values. But for me, the little flower box and the little plot and the allotment, it must be, you must move beyond that one to produce a lot of food. So now we use the slaughterhouse to sort of focus the possibility to uh, value what you can do in one square meter and how you can, you know, copy paste and make a grid of small scale urban farming that will supply all or most of the food needed in the city. Yeah, which is which is which is proteins, fish, uh, all, all the amino acids we all need, and the mushrooms. Yes. So, so, so we make it. I mean, we can't grip the whole thing, but we have. We know that you know in in Sweden, and probably for you too, the fastest growing segments in food and with most money, it's fish and vegetables. Those are very positive if you want to invest money. And fish and vegetables, they're also very good for you. They are healthy for us. So the Swedish government says we should eat 50% more fish. Ah. And everybody claims this. The Swedes should eat 50% more fish. You know, we have 95,000 lakes. We have two, more than 2,000 kilometers of coast. We, have, we are free, we don't have wars, we are rich, we could have aquaculture, but we have the worst aquaculture situation in Europe, I would say, related to our potential. And only 10% of Swedish fish is caught or farmed in Sweden. 90% comes from abroad. So we think we are the proud aquatic water coast people. We are not. We swim and sail in on the coast, but we don't use the coast, and it's dead. 
So we have to do something. So in order to, to raise the level of, 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 of uh, you know, our own production, we must, we cannot go fish in the sea because it's either toxic or dead. Yeah, which, is, which is the Baltic Sea, I assume. Yeah, the Baltic Sea is toxic, but the western coast is also toxic, and the fish stocks are depleted. We kill them all. Ah. So with few, with, few, with few exceptions, we kill it all. So now we prove that from our slaughterhouse example, if a city like Göteborg or Westeros or Boros, between 100,000 and 500,000 people, if we could use an area... Uh, uh, existing houses or new built houses use the area 10% of the classrooms used for lower and higher education we could farm all the fish needed for the city's 100% self-dependency on fish and we would include using the 10% of the classroom area we could raise the level of consumption with 50% so then we start to, and this is not, you know, some research from, from Shanghai or from New York. It's, it's our examples from the slaughterhouse. We know that in one year, in existing farm system, we grow 100 kilos on one square meter. And we grow 2,000 kilos of fish in 50 square meters. So 50 square meters of fish and 100 square meters of vertical farming greenhouse will supply 100 people with all the fish and all the greens in one year. So yeah. we start to, we can measure now. Yeah. How much do you use? Yeah, it's interesting. I know there's a big project in the US. Um, um, I think it's the, the, the factory or the, the firm. Um, and they're experimenting also in the Netherlands, but it's always a challenge to, to get these systems in a, in a sort of state of quo that they actually keep on functioning because it's, it, it's, a, it generally, it's, it's so complicated or they make it complicated based on technology to make the system uh, functioning. Have you, have you encountered that problem too? No. <laughs> no. I, I know, I think it's a, I, I know that you, visited a company in, in uh, Göteborg that uh, are sort of a key a player in this question. Because, you know, if you, if you form an aquaponic system, you, we have two, in 50 square meters, we have two species of fish. And we grow 2,000 kilos of fish in this 50 square meters. If we double, we can use two layers, then we have from two to four tons of fish. But we are happy with two that's a very that's a lot of fish from 50 square meters and if you grow uh, 2000 kilos of fish two tons of fish you have nutrients for 20 tons of greens so when you when you start planning for an aquaponic system you you panic because you think the equation must be a perfect you know, you have two tons of fish, you must have 20 tons of greens. And if you don't provide a space for 20 tons of greens, you have a problem because you have uh, nutrients in excess. So, so what we can do, uh, according to Swedish legislation, which is, um, which is crazy, we can just put all the rich, nutrient-rich fish water out in the sewage and kill the ocean. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's okay. Because the legislation is based on aquaculture. So normally yeah. when you grow fish in the sea, there's no barrier between the fish tank because it's a bag, it's a net, you know. So all the nutrients, you feed the fish with protein-rich feed, which will uh, uh, get a lot of uh, nutrients out in the water from the gills and from, from, the, from the waste, fish waste. And there's no barrier. It just goes out in the water body. So when we farm up on land we can you know we can keep everything in the city block but we are allowed to let it out in the ocean but instead of doing that say we have two tons of fish we grow only 10 tons of greens so then we have excess extra uh, nutrient for 10 tons of greens but we can extract that and have it in a dry form or a liquid form so this liquid um, uh, nutrient uh, soup can be sold in the in the plant store so 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 that's what we are we, today we're not quite there 
but we have a good partner and it's an innovative uh, Swedish West Coast company that can so so then you don't have to be so exact in your yeah. equation and uh, I think that's a key factor because everybody working with aquaponics they think oh you know today now the the we harvested too much so yeah. and so that means we have too much fish so we have to kill the fish or we have to let everything out and pollute the river mm -hmm. so it shouldn't be problematic so you, sh you have different factors so you can calibrate it's like a stove in a nuclear plant <laughs> You can control the process. You don't have to panic because you harvested all the greens because you can t take out the excess. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's how we're going to solve our problem. Now that sounds that sounds to be key in, in what most people the, most people perceive hydroponics more as you said managing the plants and the fish together. But if you take out the excess nutrients, you have the right balance, and you don't have to. Uh, uh, you, be frightened that some something some organism will be killed due due to that. Yes, and it's it, it's quite tricky to have the balance because it, the, the the two systems uh, you, they won't be synchronized. That you harvest. Be, at the same yeah. time. So it's much easier to to take out the nutrients to to get the system in balance. Uh, so uh, and for us. Uh, we are a bit surprised that nobody asked the question or actually really tried, they made a, 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 a strong effort to solve the problem. It shouldn't be a problem. So, but, but it's not so strange because these aquaponic, uh, the systems, they are talked a lot, uh, uh, talked about a lot, but they are not materialized. We, have, we are so few in, in this business. And it's also a, it's a fun, interesting problem, but now the government goes out and say that next year they will supply the market with a lot of money to explore the possibilities of, of bringing fish and greens to, to the new built houses. But there are hardly anybody with any kind of experience. So uh, for us, it's about, uh, so government says, we believe that we can create 200,000 new jobs. And in a small country, 200,000 new jobs in food sector. Oh, that's revolutionary. It's fantastic. And the figures come from us. So yeah, we hand them over to the government. And uh, actually, the government are listening to us. So we believe that too. But where will we find? To, can you guys move up? You and your friends, can you come to us in Göteborg starting January 2018 to strengthen the, the workforce? I mean, we don't have people dealing with it. The sector is so small, so now we must move on quite fast. And then we get in, run into the interesting problem that there are a lot of academia that think that the problem and the solutions are theirs. Yeah. So they think we must have a doctor's degree just to go down the road discussing the point. But that's not the way to do it. No. So it's like we, we, try to, we try to merge what we call nerd knowledge you know <laughs> the smart people in the cellars they sit and drink uh, you know uh, uh, whatever they drink and they are smart maybe they have just two days in school and you have to merge the nerd knowledge uh, uh, um, sort of a level with the academic science level and you must teach them to respect each other so they can join forces so when we have professors in Slagtuset, I have some very brilliant people on my crew. So I tell the brilliant guys that you must be kind to the professors. You know, don't ask the tricky questions. Just be kind and ask, you know, soft questions. Because they are brilliant. And the professors are really good. Well performing, but not like my guys. You know? And it's interesting because there are so many people, so, so much potential and so much work capacity in their brains <laughs> use them you know include them in this talk uh, Niklas, i also remember i also remember a uh, anecdote and, and you show me the pictures of your past where uh, if i if i recall correctly it all started with bringing some pigs into the city yeah yeah i had a we had a <laughs> 
I made a pre-study, uh, sort of academic, you know, writing stuff. It was about, should we introduce urban agriculture? This is 10 years ago, into 49 municipalities in Western Sweden. And, and, and the answer to my report that the regional board of environment paid me for, it was, yeah, we probably should. So I tried to make a stakeholder analysis. I mean, who should be involved in making more food on urban land and it happened that I teamed up with the, the Swedish or the Bishop of Göteborg and the former Bishop. He's a nice guy. Uh, and also I engaged uh, uh, interreligious council and one uh, in my steering group for bringing or making uh, urban agriculture happen. I had the Bishop, I had uh, the rabbi, there's one is the Jewish boss in Göteborg, mm -hmm. the big rabbi. And I had one of the imams, the Muslim boss, Fuad. And, and it was really nice because we, 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 we said that with emphasis, the emphasis that, you know, in all religions, in all times all over the world, uh, we have worshipped food and soil. So let's, let's, put that in the middle to to create you know a lot of good feelings here we have to focus food and soil and our first uh, project it was about making a garden in almost central uh, Göteborg in Högsbo and we had a big lawn and and my grandmother had pigs and I want pigs too I never had pigs so I we I wanted pigs but so I went to the bishop and I told him that uh, there's an other guy and he proposed pigs. But I know it's really stupid because the imam and the rabbi, I mean, it, I just want to inform you, dear bishop. And the bishop is, a, yeah, that's really stupid. It will not happen. Okay, I understand it will not happen. But then I, I, I gave it another shot. So I... I was going with the train from Stockholm to Göteborg with a rabbi, the, the Jewish boss. And he's a big guy with a big beard. You have respect for him. You have to. And he's a good guy. And we sometimes in Sweden, we drink beer on the train. So halfway on the train trip, we had some beer. And I, I, I made a, a run for it. So I told... Uh, Dear Rabbi, there's another guy who proposed pigs in Hexpo, but I know it's stupid because you're a rabbi, you're Jewish, you don't like pigs. And the rabbi said, no, uh, you are stupid. I love pigs and I really want them. I, I can have, you know, spare parts to my heart from pigs. I can't eat them. So what's the problem? So the rabbi said, yes. And it sounds like a stupid story, but this is the way it was. And then I went to the imam. He's even bigger with a bigger, and I have a little afraid of him. I'm, he's a tough guy. And I told him the same, that there's another guy and uh, he wants pigs, but I know it's stupid because you are the imam and Muslims don't. And he says that you just uh, drive. You don't understand the issue. The big God tells us to cherish and honor and love all creatures on the planet. Some we can eat, some not. So, so the thing is that we, we made a very, we, we sort of uh, put the flag for, for change in the, how you look on, on an urban uh, structure and what, you, what can happen there. We really put the flag high up with, with a, we had pigs and the people blessing the pigs were rabbis and imams and it's a true story. Wow. And this, this made a lot happen and also it made us, uh, uh, we got a lot of self-esteem. We thought anything is possible. And already with the first pigs, and these are the first pigs in Göteborg since World War II. So when we applied to have pigs, you know, the, nobody in the city had seen this. The last time anybody applied to have a pig permit in, in Göteborg, this was 1943. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the civil service, they were just, what the hell is this? What are we going to do? But we were blessed by the civil servants and by the imam. And, uh, and we had the pigs. And it was about, you know, not just do a spectacular thing, but it was about discussing urban 
metabolic principles. Mm -hmm. Why the heck should we take all apples and why all pieces of bread and all cheese and make biogas, which is the major uh, model in Sweden. We are proud over the biogas system, but it's stupid. I mean, apples in the fall and this uh, salad and stuff and, and city food waste, it should not go into the uh, the big uh, biogas stomach. It should be, before we do that, it should be handed over to, I mean, from apples, you make cider and apple juice and calvados and apple pie, or you feed it to chicken and pigs or fish. You don't give it to the biogas monster. So now we are, so already with the pigs 10 years ago, we said we will move on to water living pigs and that will be a tropic omnivore fish that will eat the city waste so in these years we moved on the pigs are accepted we have had pigs in 15 places they don't cause diseases they don't kill people they don't smell you just get happy with the urban pigs and then you kill them and you eat them they have one bad day in life that's when you kill them and then you serve them in the best restaurant so we don't have pigs to, you know, to kill more pigs. We have pigs because we want less pigs to be killed and the right happy pigs to be killed. So now we are in the, with the water living pigs. And people, we have warmed up the discussion about urban metabolic systems where you could add uh, animal production to the system. So... Uh, so a lot of people say, yeah, we like it. But now when we want to take, in Sweden, uh, the last two years we had 100 new microbreweries, maybe 200, a lot of them. And this is extremely interesting because our food production system structure is extremely large, large units. We are like the U.S., Mm -hmm. uh, much worse than in the rest of Europe, large units. And that's the Swedish economic model and the industrial model. So out of the, the 10 largest European hospitals, two or three are Swedish. And we're a small country. We love big things. So now we try to break up the structure. But when we, uh, 100 meter from the slug tuset, where we have the fish plant and the insects, there's a new brewery. So... When you put the malt into the system, you boil the malt and you take the sugar from the malt and some, uh, some flavor, and you get a, a, a hygienized, very good produce that's a leftover that used to be fed to the pigs and to the chicken and to the cows and to the, to, to the sheep, but now there are no pigs and stuff, so you throw it away. Or at the best, you make biogas of it. So now we can take this fantastic produce and take it to the slaughterhouse, feed it to insects, and get fish food that we don't take from the ocean. It's fantastic, but it's theft because the waste belongs to the waste entrepreneur. So we mm -hmm. are stealing this. We do fantastic stuff, but it's theft. So now we have to go to the 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 company that owns the waste it's a huge company and we say could we cooperate and and they say yes but then it's this starts with the legislation and all the regulations and all this so now we are happy to work with long leash we yeah. break the law we do a lot of things wrong but actually the the offices are responsible for uh, all this uh, infrastructure, they say, yeah, it's okay, break the law. We must change the laws, but it takes some time. So there are a lot of us where we are working in gray zone, and, and we hope that we will still be blessed and not put in jail. Yeah, I think, what, what, what would you be the three takeouts when, when you would be dealing with these kind of forefront visionary projects based on legislation? What, 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 what is in general you encounter? Uh, I mean, I think that most, if, for me, I mean, I'm really happy when we could introduce the pigs. We haven't had them for a long time. And urban Europe is very polished with glass and aluminum and stuff. And you don't, it's a Gucci, you know, it should be nice. And the city scene, it should be nice. You shouldn't step in dog shit or, you know, there shouldn't be any waste. Thing. So 
a lot of politicians and decision makers, they are afraid that you will blur the picture or smear the logotype and stuff like that. So you have to tender, you really have to be, when you promote the sort of the, the, the food scene, you, you know, it's a problem that we talk a lot about clean tech. And the pictures of clean tech, it's really clean. It's plastic and it's, the surfaces are so nice. It's biophobe, you know, there's nothing dirty. All the nails are really nice and all the shoes are really nice. And it's very much, uh, uh, yeah, the, the polished surface, which corresponds to a, a tendency that we go biophobe. Some people are out, you know, with their mountain bikes and stuff, and then they climb trees and they do stuff. But a lot of people are not. So when you when you say uh, that food technology, it's important, it's crucial to bring food technology into the city. But that's not clean tech. It's dirty. If you kill a fish, there's a lot of blood and slime there, and somebody will have that on your hands. And so when you try to clean away. Uh, this the blood and the slime from the picture you're sort of lying a bit so you are entering a difficult area of discussion because this the food uh, even if it's vegetables it's slimy and dirty and sort of fill yeah. and it rots you know insects they crawl and they have all they look strange so you move into this that some people the biophobe society try to leave behind so the biophobes in the in the european clean high techy clean techy society they, they they leave that to china and malaysia they can kill the fish and uh, we import nice packages you know so so it's sort of tricky because you you must you know hold the hands and embrace people and say yeah it's a bit dirty and uh, yeah this is alive and you have to kill it and there will be blood <laughs> so you have to deal with this messy uh, dimension of of modern urban life Modern urban life will be messy and bloody and slimy. Yeah, so no. it, you know, when I present it like this, it can never be done because nobody wants a messy, slimy, bloody, dirty life, <laughs> but with insects. But it's uh, not, you, you, you know, the I went to, a, I was invited to a conference about the new city, the modern city, and we were going to talk technology, and it was presented with a a ball bearing, just stainless steel. And it was so clean. And it was presented as clean tech will save us or something. And I, I got sick because I saw it's not, a, yeah, it's about clean tech, but also about slimy tech. So how do you do that? You must be aware of the fact that you are pushing, you're trying to push or um, uh, to introduce old stuff that we try to get rid of our best and the people that were into slimy bloody tech they were you know low lives in society they were selling stuff on the market and they had dirty shoes and uh, and all that so how do you so a lot of the for me it's a, a bit tricky because a lot of the urban farmers now they uh, pretend that they are in in clean tech and if they are they are not solving the real problems because urban agriculture can't just be you know, clean tech. It can be probably cleaner than a lot of uh, uh, traditional mm -hmm. agriculture, but you will never get rid of the fact that if you lead a, a, let, a head of lettuce in the, you know, in the open, it will rot and it will stink and there will be a stream of, and there will be flies and stuff. It should be like that. That's biology. That's nature, you know? Yeah, that's true. That's completely true. You mentioned before um, that uh, you um, collaborated now with, I think, was the city of Malmö to set up that city project. Um, uh, well, we, we are now, <laughs> we just, um, there's, there's a Malmö, they are, uh, they are doing very good stuff and in cooperation with uh, Göteborg. But uh, I was part of introducing the system in Göteborg. But what's happening now in, in Malmö that, um, that, uh, that I'm uh, extremely happy about it. Last, last week we won a, a big contest building a city block with 10 houses on the most expensive uh, uh, land in Sweden. 
it's in Malmö and it's a new part of town called Hylje and this project um, uh, it's uh, presented by the you should say the fanciest uh, Nordic architects so it's called there's one company called Vingård it's uh, it's very fancy and they are Swedish and um, and um, Yale and it's a Danish bureau they are top notch and and they include us in their competition and we are not in the flashy segment we are maybe hip for some people but we're not in the flash segment but now they include us and we win so <laughs> yeah and that's and that's a lot of fun because they will join us tomorrow when the minister of housing comes and and for some reason these super flashy bureaus like what we are doing and and they must understand that it is not, you know, the, the clean tech thing. It's the dirty slime tech thing we're doing. <laughs> but even our slime tech mission is accepted by them. They are not stupid. So, uh, and that means something that not just the hipsters and the people that are really have been digging into uh, urban sustainability and resilience and all that, but also these flash. Uh, uh, and we are happy about that. So now we see what that will bring because it will definitely, and it's also, you know, with more interesting uh, actors around the table, the more people that are proud over what you are doing, even if you move into slime tech, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. that, that's important for, for making things spin. So, um, so and actually I it was also on the braggy part, but in this Hylje, this fantastic new place, I was invited to, talk about the future food and uh, uh, I I was asked if I could present future food in front of 400 people big stage and the the Swedish super chef his name is Tarek Taylor everybody loves him I love him too and I was going to bring my food my my urban uh, fish up and present and I I was really nervous I'm not so nervous normally but I like this guy and he's very He's very candid. He says what he thinks. So I, I was afraid that he would say, this tastes like, you know, slime or it's really bad. I can't eat it. But he, he provided, the, 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 he said what I w hoped. So he said, it's really good stuff. And, and that's a, um, so we are in Hylje pro, uh, promoting future food uh, and future fish. And, I, so I don't forget it. I must say that, but that from the 50 square meters in Slaktuset, where you visited us, uh, we produce two tons of fish. And um, when you look at this in an environmental way, we, we can produce food for the fish that, is, that comes from city waste. We don't have to uh, destroy the ocean, and that's very nice. And we don't have to destroy the environment by, by uh, uh, polluting it. So, and, and when it comes to climate and uh, climate gas emissions from our system, uh, we use maybe one twentieth of the carbon dioxide or equivalents that is used for uh, producing eco-labeled fish from wild systems. So it's very environmentally smart. It's very uh, uh, climate smart. And we don't use one drop or one gram of uh, uh, medicine for the fish. This is unheard of. When you farm fish, you use medical substances, pharmaceutical substances to keep them alive. Uh, yes. uh, I'm, I'm, I'm still curious, why, why was NASA visiting you? Uh, it was, I, well, I think they, it must be my body. No, no idea. It's, it was funny because they, I teach at Chalmers and it's a technical university. They work, they are pretty good. And, and they called me and they said, can you, can you take care of Mr. Alan Toops? And I <laughs> never heard about this man. So, no, yeah, please, you must. Okay. So Mr. Alan Toops and his partner, they come to me in Slaktus and I have coffee. And, and uh, this Alan Toops, he, he says that I'm Alan Toops from NASA. And I would like to discuss fish farming zero gravity with you. 
and I'm, you know, fish for me zero gravity. <laughs> we don't do that, but please have some more coffee and a Swedish bulle. But after this, um, this guy, he's, the, he's one of the responsible persons for the uh, food program or the food production program on the space station on Mars. And that's a bit exotic for me. I don't go to Mars that often, and I don't think in terms of, you know, zero gravity food production. But now we are, we are sharing stage, and we have been together in a program called BioLoops, Bio Loops. And he talks about food production on space station on Mars, and I talk about smart food production in Slack to Sudjotoboy. And actually, next year, we have NASA students financed by <laughs> American government, and they are in Slagtus, because I teach NASA students, and they love what they see. So I don't know whether, well, I'm not going to mention the president, but it feels very strange to have American students financed by that government. But yeah. And NASA, you know, and NASA, they are, uh, they have a, they have a lot of resources, and we don't, we just do stuff, and sometimes these guys think we're doing interesting stuff, so they say they can help us with students and with some setups, and 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 actually, uh, you know, a city uh, in Göteborg or in the Netherlands or in in France. It's not so far from from a space station on Mars. You have you should be as clever in the in the Netherlands or in Sweden as on Mars. You can't, you know, uh, you can't do that. You can't grow fish and just use put all the nutrients in the river. But we do it. You shouldn't do that. And and they provide us with quite clever tech, uh, technology now and then. So. No, I think well, one thing I've learned from you, Nicholas, when, when I was there and, and also what I'm just hearing now, which is like th four years after we met, it's, it's basically do it, learn, iterate, um, involve a lot of stakeholders into your project and see how they can contribute to it. But keep leading and have the vision. Um, and then the, the, the puzzle pieces will, will merge someday. Uh, don't be afraid of it. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's really, if you have the opportunity, if you have the resources, I mean, you're not starving and, and you have the bravery because it will take that and you, you are willing to sacrifice maybe a pension plan <laughs> and, that's, uh, and that kind of stuff, then it's really nice. I mean, to, to, uh, it's a hope thing and it's about uh, actually embracing future and um, like you said, it will, a lot of the, 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 the jigsaw puzzle pieces, they will form a nice pattern if you let them. And it's, uh, a, a, if you present your, uh, your, your case and you have, some kind of, you have some kind of plan, a lot of people will understand your plan and they want to join forces and add their resources to you. So if you let that happen, it sounds you know, a bit religious and strange, but that has been our story for a long time that uh, yeah you will run into problems but there is some kind of uh, there are a lot of nice people that will uh, help you yeah. and uh, and it's necessary <laughs> i mean uh, we can never buy not at the moment we cannot buy the uh, the the, uh, the consultant services but we are actually uh, people hand their brilliance to us uh, for yeah. free and it's not it's for us it's uh, I like that system. It's a good starting point, but we must bring this technology and these systems into a market where we are paid for what we do. So it's not okay that the politicians and civil servants and institutions think that, oh, you know, they are happy. Just give them some coffee and they are so happy, like artists, like Van Gogh or whatever, you know, we're just pushing ourselves towards borders because we are programmed that way. There must be a market for moving uh, uh, structures, infrastructural uh, problems and solutions forward uh, in front of uh, the society's uh, mainstream, you know, workshops. There must be a market for that. And a lot of people, we are, I think for the moment, it, everything looks very promising. A lot of people, they do much more interesting stuff than we do, but they don't have the, the skills and they are not lent the ears. So they actually, uh, 
they uh, it is not working. So they go down the drain, and it uh, it hurts me, you know, because yeah. there's so many people and they do the right stuff, but they don't understand that you have to be functional in a technical sense or biological sense. You have to lobby, you have to talk and present and be funny and be a lot of stuff. It should be enough that you have solutions and that you have a good analysis, but it's never. It's never enough, you know? <laughs> and that's, a, that's tricky. Yeah, no, but it's, it's good. It's good to share that to my viewers. Um, that it's 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 a mindset, and it, it's always a challenge to get there. But you should never be scared and and collaborate. And you, most of the time, you find different collaborations than you would ever imagine, and let and let things happen. That's I think what I've met a lot of people similar to you, Nicholas, and they all have the same mindset. Just let the puzzle evolve slowly, but don't be scared and, and help people see the connections um, and basically educate them too, slightly. Yes, and, and it's uh, and, uh, what I'm working with, trying to, uh, because I want things to move, evolve much faster. And uh, because I, I think I know we should go this direction and, and the progress are too slow. And uh, you tend to, a lot of people with me, we get uh, frustrated and a bit angry. <laughs> and it's not fun to hang out with angry, <laughs> frustrated people. So you have to sort of breathe and say, instead of, you know, barking at people, I should, I should help. And like you say, you know, embrace people and try to aid them in some way. And it's a mindset too. I don't, because I analyze and maybe sometimes I know stuff. I'm not entitled to bark at people and be an asshole just because I, you know, I'm frustrated. And it's not nice to hang around me when I'm barking and being an asshole. So, so you have to discuss this with yourself and your friends. How should we deal with our other people? Because we are... Uh, we, we must do that uh, to build a nice, soft interface to, to politicians, civil, civil servants, and, and all those with more resources that we maybe have ourselves. But uh, that's not easy. <laughs> that's true. That's good. I have a, just to conclude um, for, for today, I have a, always, I always end these podcasts with, with, a, with, with the final question, which is, could you recommend any reference or books or movies uh, my viewers should watch to understand uh, uh, the insights you've gained. Like, who who were your teachers? Uh, yeah, I I would I would recommend. I will point at one guy, and it's a it's a London professor. Uh, his name is Tim Lang, and uh, he writes uh, stuff about. Uh, he he wrote a book called Food Wars. And it's very scary and it's very interesting. And, and today we are seeing a food war going on and it's about fish. We have a Western model where we eat salmon, we farm salmon, we eat salmon and we eat uh, predators. And it's very stupid. You know, 93% of the fish produced farmed fish, it comes from Asia. China, 63%, the rest of Asia, 30, 93%. And that the, those the fish they eat they are uh, carps and uh, tilapia cichlids and and those ones and they are herbivores or 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 omnivores. If the Norwegians the Westerners will win, then everybody will farm carnivores predators, and then the planet will go. Uh, yeah, it's gone because it's very bad. So that's a food war going on. So Tim Lang, food wars. Okay. It's a bit academic, but it's important. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much for that, Nicholas. Um, thank you for being my master guest for today. Uh, it's again an honor to, uh, to have a chat with you. Um, join us the next time with another Masters of Beautiful Achievement guest to explore the wonders of nature's solutions. Um, thank you, bye-bye.